Let's go back to the beginning, at least the beginning of my awareness of what we now call Planet X. Spring of 2002, I had two individuals, a couple of friends of mine approach me. My friend Tom, who's a pilot and an aircraft mechanic. My friend Ron, who's a veteran of the peacetime army in Germany during the 1960s. Both these men are independent researchers, and they start telling me about Planet X and this book titled Blindsided by Mark Hazelwood. Mark did something that most authors won't do. He put evidence in the book that conflicts with his own value system. Most New Age authors, for example, won't have anything to do with the Bible, and most Bible scholars won't have anything to do with New Age information. But Mark Hazelwood included both, including historical evidence, archaeological evidence, fossilized evidence, geological, astronomical, biblical, psychic evidence, and last but not least, a lady who claims to talk to aliens. Now, that was a bit too much for me. However, I read the book, and I know documentation when I see it. I know evidence when I see it. Now, for a homicide detective, evidence is something you can put a blue evidence label on, mark it, and hand it to the court clerk as evidence. And much of what he had in the book is good evidence, well documented that you can go back and find the original source material. So despite the lady who claimed to talk to aliens, who, by the way, gave her a date of the closest passage, that date being June of 2003, I continued my research, and I went deeper and deeper into the topic of Planet X. You heard in the introduction I've been looking at Planet X-related matters since 1980. I began an independent research project in 1980, not knowing until 1992, 93, actually, what it was really all about. Going back to 1979, I found myself single, free weekends, looking for a hobby. I'd been out of the Army for nine or ten years, and I decided to go back in the Army Reserves as a Green Beret and let your tax dollars pay for my weekend fund. It seemed like a good deal to me. We spent a lot of our weekends in Special Forces training at a place called the Welding Springs Training Area, just west of St. Louis in St. Charles County. And along about 1980, the Department of Energy announced a Superfund cleanup project out there to clean up nuclear waste. Now, that was my first red flag because of the following. We knew, we guys in the Army knew, that the military had been working with nuclear material out there for decades. So the men I worked with on their own, without even telling the Army, they went to the trouble to get radiation detection equipment. And when we'd go out there training, they would routinely check out the training area to make sure there wasn't anything, because they didn't want to have kids with flippers instead of arms. It seemed like a good idea at the time. Point being, they never found any nuclear material. Barely anything above natural background radiation. Over the years, I watched this Department of Energy cleanup site become a fairly good-sized project. They drug in the job trailers. They built about oh, 15, 17,000 17,000 square feet of administrative buildings. Sometimes I would go by and photograph the names of the subcontractors at the front gate. At any government construction site, they always list the names of all the subcontractors at the front gate. One name happened to catch my eye one day, Worldwide Telecom. I didn't recognize that as a local business. So I submitted a Freedom of Information Act request to the Department of Energy for the contract specifications for world, Worldwide Telecom, along with two other requests for an engineering firm and a survey company. A few weeks later, I get a response back in the mail with the contract specs for the engineering company and the survey company, and a letter denying that Worldwide Telecom was even a subcontractor out there. And that kind of got my attention, so I went to a friend of mine who I thought might know who these people were, and he says, John, here's, what, here's the deal. Now, this is in St. Louis. He says, so, first of all, they're headquartered in New Jersey. Second of all, if you were going to build a brand new Pentagon, 
these are the people you would hire to put in the telecommunications. So that brought up even more questions. Under another Freedom of Information Act request, I asked how many phone lines they had out there at this construction site. The answer came back a couple of weeks later, 500 telephone lines. That sounded a bit large to me, so I talked to some contractor friends of mine, engineers, who had spent 30 and 40 years in commercial construction, asking them, asking them what the largest number of phone lines they ever saw at the biggest construction site in their 40-year career of working commercial construction work, things like Boulder Dam and so forth, 50. 50 phone lines at the largest construction site they ever saw in their 40-year career. Over the years, I interviewed different men who were working there, surveyors. I found out that everything was compartmentalized. They'd bring in one crew of surveyors to do a little section, another crew for over here from a different company, and a third and a fourth and so forth. Everything was compartmentalized. I interviewed an engineer that worked out there. This was just fairly recently. And she was telling me, this was an, she's an electrical engineer, she couldn't understand the level of uh, confidentiality and secrecy at a no big deal construction site. How there were certain areas that were completely off limits unless you had a certain pass and a certain badge. I talked to a man who was working on concrete out there. He said, John, I never in my career put titanium flakes in concrete before. So all in all, what we came to find out, looking at the infrastructure, the communications, the power that was going in there and still going in there, the water, fresh water, sewage treatment, and so forth, all this being underground, is that they were building a command and control center where hundreds of men and women and their families, if necessary, could live, work, play, have microwave pizza, and watch movies for years if they needed to. A very large, self-contained complex. I knew that quite a long time ago, but I couldn't make the connection. It appeared to be very military on one hand, but it wasn't the military. So it was kind of a big question mark. What I did come to learn, however, is that Superfund cleanup projects amount to a bottomless pit of unaccountable money. There's very few people that understand the technology of cleaning up nuclear waste, very few and even less understand how much it costs or how long it takes. The attitude of the congressman appropriating the money is, how much money do you need? Do you need another 10 million? How long will it take? Take as long as it takes. We want this stuff out of here, no matter how much it costs or how much it takes, we will give you as much money as you need. That's the attitude of the public and Congress when it comes to cleaning up nuclear waste. And that's what they did out there was spend millions and millions of dollars doing that project. We have any veterans of the U.S. Navy in here? Not Navy? Army. Well, the military in general is a subculture of our American culture. And of course, the Navy is a subculture of the military culture. However, there's another subculture, and that's the U.S. Navy Submarine Corps. Now, every man who's ever set foot in a submarine as a crew member, whether he's the lowest ranking, least experienced, newest guy on the ship, has the IQ to be an officer. It's a very select group of men. That's not done in very many units. Special Forces happens to be another one. I happen to know two men who served with the United States Submarine Corps. One of them since 1979. Very close friend. I was having lunch with him last summer. I was telling him about Planet X, and he's telling me about the Ross Ice Shelf, R-O-S-S, the Ross Ice Shelf in the Antarctic. And he's telling me about a physics class, a classified physics class taught by a Navy officer over 20 years ago. Navy officer is now an admiral. What the U.S. Navy was telling the Submarine Corps more than 20 years ago is what will happen when the Ross Ice Shelf and the rest of the ice at the Antarctic melts. They told them that the ocean levels will rise 14 to 32 feet. 
and it won't be like a bathtub filling with water. There'll be violent storms accompanying the rising ocean levels. I was telling him about Planet X, as I mentioned, and it wasn't until the next day that I realized we were both talking about the same thing. That he was talking about an effect, and I was talking about a cause. There has to be a trigger to cause this ice to melt. And I believe now we know what that trigger is. For more recently, I recalled a map that a patient of my wife had showed me, oh, going back 14 years or so. My wife, a chiropractor, has a lot of patients. One of them brought in this map that was prepared by Gordon Michael Scallion, a map that was alleged to be what North America looks like after these waters come up and land has raised and land has sunk beneath the ocean. At the time, I looked at this map and I thought to myself, this is a very nice, full color fantasy, and this lady needs a tinfoil hat real bad. That was my thought. I didn't have any anything else to correlate it to. More recently, however, I remembered this map, and I looked it up on the internet, a small version, about four by five inches, and I emailed it to my friend in the submarine corps. He, email, he emails me back, and he says, John, it's pretty accurate. It's, it's just about exactly what the Navy told us this is going to look like, except most of Wisconsin's gone, uh, according to the Navy, and it's not on this map. Now, this map shows large portions of the United States being underwater. Parts of the East Coast, about half of Florida, most of Louisiana, an inland sea, according to both the Navy and my friend, stretching from the Great Lakes to Hudson Bay, uninterrupted. Mississippi River, coming up from what used to be New Orleans, almost up to Memphis, five to ten times wider than it is now. A couple of months ago, I was a guest lecturer at a college class, along with another gentleman who spent 20 years in military intelligence with the Air Force. This gentleman did a three-year tour of duty with the Submarine Corps. We're having dinner afterwards, and I bring up the topic of the Ross Ice Shelf. His wife's sitting next to me, and, and he starts telling me about what he knew about the Ross Ice Shelf, basically parallel to what my friend told me a few months previously. Then his wife pipes up and says, well, when it came time to retire, we were living in Virginia. The gentleman was working in the Pentagon. They could move anywhere in the United States. They'd been a military family for 20 years and were used to living all over and had friends literally all over the country. When it came time to pick their retirement home, they specifically picked the Missouri, Arkansas, Ozarks because of the altitude and because of what the U.S. Navy told them about rising waters. My friend also that I had lunch with last year, he also picked the Missouri Arkansas Ozarks because of what the US Navy told him in classified briefings about rising water. Being on the road the past week, I've bumped into a number of people who know the zip codes just because they sell insurance, for example. A lot of records are kept by zip codes. And there is a noticeable increase of military retirees living in the zip codes that comprise the Missouri Arkansas Ozarks, especially Navy veterans. For those who need a little more evidence they can get their arms around, the Pentagon issued a report in October 2003. I need to read this to you because you can't possibly memorize something as convoluted as this. It's titled, An Abrupt Climate Change Scenario and Its Implications for United States National Security, October 2003 commissioned by the United States Defense Department, authored by Mr. Schwartz and Mr. Randall. What these authors say in this report that the Pentagon authorized and paid for is that global warming should be taken out of the area of being kind of a routine scientific debate and put in the area of a clear and present national security matter. Right now, not later. That abrupt climate change may occur in the not-too-distant future, not decades in the future, in the not-too-distant future, causing longer, harsher winters and 
America, massive droughts turning farmland into dust bowls and forests to ashes. Now you may say to yourself, John, it sounds like you're talking about global warming. Well, I am. And here's why. You might recall that global warming became an issue about 1985. Now by 1985, the government knew full well what would be happening 20 years later. They knew the events that would be occurring and why they would be occurring. And they knew they needed a cover story to keep, keep everybody calm and peaceful, going to work every morning, paying their mortgage, and being good little citizens. So the cover story they decided on was global warming. And it's been very effective. And here's the way I break it down. These percentages are my percentages are not from any scientific study or anything, but I've chosen these as representative of what I feel has been going on here for a while. About 49.5 percent of the population believes global warming is a clear and present danger, putting the earth at risk, putting animals and plant life at risk, and human beings at risk of harm, and that is caused by that knucklehead next door in his SUV human activity. That's about 49.5% of the adults. Another 49.5% of the adults believe one of the two things. Either that global warming isn't happening at all and isn't real, or that it's kind of a naturally occurring, slow-moving event, and it won't do any harm, and there's nothing we can do about it anyway. That's the other 49%. That leaves 1%, ladies and gentlemen. That's you in the audience. That's you folks watching this tape. The 1% who actually get their news someplace other than television news, who take the time to actually read books and look for alternative news on the Internet or on shortwave radio. That's 1% or less of the adults in this country. Maybe 1.5%, because according to the American Library Association, 3% of the adults in this country have a library card, and half of them use their library card for light entertainment reading, leaving about 1.5% that you both have a library card and use it for something other than light entertainment reading. The deception continues. I have a current issue of The Economist magazine published in London, and they have an article, not an interview, but an article written by the Prime Minister of of England, Mr. Tony Blair. Now, you might imagine that if you're the Prime Minister of England and you're writing an article that's going to be published in one of the most respected magazines on the planet, it's going to be edited, reviewed, edited, and reviewed for content, for legality, for scientific accuracy, and of course for grammar. Quote, this temperature rise has meant a rise in sea levels. Current tense. The Prime Minister of England is talking about sea levels rising right now, because they are rising right now. If it continues as predicted, it will mean hundreds of millions of people increasingly at risk from flooding, and climate change means more than warmer weather. It means extreme, increasingly unpredictable weather events, rainstorms, droughts, heavy human and economic cost. Now, of course, this was written prior to many of the events that we're now aware of happening. The lead time typically for a magazine like this is several months. Here's what's going on with the weather right now. Some things that you may not be aware of. There is grass growing in the Antarctic. This has never happened, ladies and gentlemen. There is grass growing on the Antarctic continent. It is surviving the winter and coming up the next spring and growing even more. This has never happened any place. At the same time we're having snowfall in Las Vegas, they're canceling snow dog sled runs and contests in Alaska because they don't have enough snow. Things are getting very, very bizarre to say the least. And the global warming issue has been very effective in keeping people in the dark as to exactly what's been going on. 
Got a few Bible quotes here for you folks. Joshua 10.13 talks about the sun standing still. Now up until fairly recently, and I mean within the last 55, 60 years since about 1950, scientists couldn't explain how the sun could possibly stand still. Bible scholars referred to Joshua 10.13 as a metaphor. Typically, Bible scholars do that. If they don't understand this stuff, they say, well, it's a metaphor. It really means something else. Well, about 1950 or so, the concept of a pole shift became apparent to scientists, and they understood how the Hebrews in the Sinai Desert could look up and see the sun not moving. For the 19th century before that, they couldn't. If, we were, if you were standing at the right place on the planet and the pole was to shift, the sun would have the appearance of standing still in the sky. Another researcher about the same time, Dr. Velikowski, Emmanuel Velikowski, he did something nobody had done previously. He did research comparing what the men studying the ancient Chinese had written and the men studying the ancient Mayans had written, and the people studying the people who live in Scandinavia, ancient folks had written, both of whom had, all those ancient cultures had written records and calendars. Velikowski reasoned that if the Hebrews standing in the Sinai Desert saw the sun standing still, then you know the Chinese must have saw it not come up the next morning when it was supposed to. Keeping in mind, the Chinese had written records and had calendars, and you could line up the Hebrew calendar and the Chinese calendar to compare them if you knew what you were doing. And guess what, ladies and gentlemen? On that date in history, when the Hebrews in the Sinai Desert saw the sun stand still, the Chinese saw the sun not come up. Well, of course. The Bible means what it says, and it's 100% accurate. Exodus 16.31, manna, manna from heaven. Now this all happened shortly after Moses made his exodus. The Hebrews in the Sinai Desert would wake up every morning and they would find substance of a certain color, of a certain substance and a certain taste lying on the ground that they could pick up and eat. Manna from heaven. As it turns out, other cultures who had written records and calendars all left written records attached to the same dates where every morning they could go out and pick up a substance of the same color and the same consistency and the same taste and eat it in China, in South America, and in Scandinavia. What we believe manna from heaven was was carbohydrates in the atmosphere that would condense when the sun hit it, it would fall to ground and you could pick up and eat it. Once again, the Bible being verified by other written records all over the planet of that same substance being there. Isaiah 24.1, Behold, the Lord maketh the earth empty and maketh it waste and turneth it upside down and scatter abroad the inhabitants thereof. That sounds like a global earthquake to me. That sounds like a very good description of a global earthquake. Isaiah 24:20, The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard and shall be removed like a cottage. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, what appears to be an excellent description of a very large global earthquake. Right there in the Bible, waiting for you to read it and look at it yourself. When I first heard this story, about Planet X, and I read Hazelwood's book, one of the first things I did was approach a friend of mine who has privileged access to certain government agencies. And I said, can you check this out? I'd appreciate it. He said, I never heard of it, but I'll check it out. He got back with me a couple of weeks later, and he says, John, it's a real thing. They've been watching this thing for more than 20 years. It's out there. They've got the Hubble watching it. They've got all this instrumentation keeping track of it. It's got a quarter million mile debris field on either side of it. When I say a debris field, I mean rocks the size of pickup trucks and rocks the size of Rhode Island. Big rocks and little rocks. It's traveling in a cloud of red dust, which means when we finally are able to see it, 
it'll probably duplicate what was seen by ancient peoples as being a red cross in the sky. The red dust will re refract the light and make it appear to be a red cross in the sky. Both my private sources and NASA says that planet X is three to five Earth masses large. About 1979, they sent the Pioneer Space Probe looking for this thing, and here's why. Astronomy uses a lot of instrumentation. They use telescopes in the visible light spectrum, telescopes in the infrared light spectrum, telescopes in the ultraviolet light spectrum, and radio telescopes. They take all this imaging, and this is where astronomy gets down to what's really important, that's mathematics. They use mathematics to determine how big these objects are, how far away they are, how fast they're traveling, how far apart they are from each other. Pioneer Space Probe determined all those things, and they've been watching it ever since. Watching it very carefully. They've determined that this object is on an elliptical orbit. That means it goes way out. And when I say way out, it takes 1,800 years to go out and 1,800 years to come back. Our planets that we're used to, Mars, Venus, Neptune, Saturn, and so forth, they make more or less a circular orbit. Some of them tend to be a bit elliptical, but pretty much circular. This planet has been the object of a lot of government activity, building shelters like what I described all over the United States, and they are in fact shelters for high-ranking government officials and their immediate families, They're including their adult children and their parents. Now all of us have heard about the, the great earthquake of December 26 and the tidal wave tsunami that followed. Most of us know that it was supposed to be the greatest earthquake since the Prince William Sound earthquake, 1964, off the coast of Alaska. But we hear these numbers about the Richter scale. And a lot of people don't understand what the Richter scale is, and I'll try to explain it in terms that you can all understand. I was in front of an audience in Detroit the other night, and I, offered, I first asked if there were any self-employed people in the audience. And we had several, and I picked one out, and I said, Sir, I will offer to work for you for 40 hours. You only need to pay me for 30, and my wages for my first hour will be one penny, and my wages for the second hour will be two pennies, and for my third hour will be four pennies, and if you will agree to double my wages until I get to 30 hours, I'll work that extra 10 hours for free. By the time you're to 30 hours, ladies and gentlemen, doubling that penny, you're about $4 million. It's a logarithmic scale. The Richter scale is a logarithmic scale. Every one-tenth of a point, starting at point one, doubles the power, doubles the intensity. So when you go from five to six, for example, you've got 1,000% more power, 5.1, 5.2, and so forth. What happened on December 26 literally shook the planet. Some scientists made the reference that it rang the, bell, or rang the earth like a bell. There's been some speculation that it may have been man-caused. However, it was predicted by at least two sets of scientists that I know of. Some Indian scientists predicted the earthquake several days before it happened based on a modality involving planetary alignment. And a gentleman named Stan Deo predicted the earthquake on December 23rd based on his observation of ocean temperatures. Now, anybody can do this. There are sensing devices in the oceans all over the planet. They feed into satellites. They feed into the Internet. You can sit in, your, in the comfort of your home and do this any place you have Internet access. He saw something in his nine years of research he'd never seen. He saw all along that 600-mile fault, drastically increasing temperatures on one side of the fault and drastically decreasing temperatures on the other. 
Now, cold water is denser and therefore more heavy than warmer water. When he saw that temperature difference along that fault, that's when he issued his warning, because he knew that was probably going to trigger an earthquake. And, of course, it did trigger an earthquake. I need to explain a little bit more about what Planet X is. We've kind of been dancing around the topic here a little bit. Every 3,600 years, this object, which has both the characteristics of a planet and the characteristics of a comet, comes through our solar system. It's well documented in the Bible. Planet X appears to be fairly well documented around the time of Moses' exodus out of Egypt. When this happens, the following things, all of them can happen or some of them. Global warming, melting polar ice, rising ocean levels, possibly a pole shift, rapid drastic climate changes, storms with torrential rains, 200 mile an hour winds, meteor strikes, volcanoes, earthquakes, tidal waves, land masses rising from the ocean, land masses sinking from the ocean. And I'm going to go over some of these things in detail. Power grids being shut down, satellite communication disruptions. We know that because of the solar activity. Now, to a certain extent, we're already seeing most of these things already happening. There's little doubt that global warming is now taking place. I think even the, the strongest doubting Thomases now believe that is the case. I was reading in the Smithsonian Magazine recently about a small island nation that is losing a lot of square feet almost every day due to rising, rising ocean levels. Meteor strikes. Apparently there's been a lot more of them through history than we were ever aware of. I'm a Missouri resident and I managed to live 55 years without knowing we had a 12 mile diameter meteor crater in Missouri. Which just happens to line up with a whole string of meteor craters. If you start at the Meteor Crater in Arizona, that's the old Route 66 tourist attraction, and connect the dots, connect the meteor craters, they string all the way across the United States. Fairly large meteor craters. There's always several dozen volcanoes going off on this planet at any given time. That's pretty much the way things have always been. It appears, though, that we have more volcanoes at the same time with more severity now than we've ever had at the same time. It wasn't so long ago, a couple of years ago, when if there was a foot of rain, it was major news. It was really major news. Now it's become almost routine. Twelve inches of rain has become something that still makes the news, but hardly like it did before. On my speaking tour, I was up in parts of the Northeast, especially Detroit, where the largest power outage in the history of this country knocked out power a couple of years ago. The government's explanations got to the point where nobody was trusting or believing what they said. First they said it was Canada was the reason. Canada let us know real quick that they weren't the reason. Then they said it was a squirrel. Then they said it was a stick. Then they said something happened in a power plant in Ohio. And I don't think we still know to this day exactly why the power went out to all those millions of people. We do know, however, that Solar activity, solar flares, can knock out power grids. That's well documented that they can do that. We need to talk a little bit about Alaska and what's going on up there. I was just reading a New York Times article. It's been published several years ago, back in 2002. And the details, as they say, is where the devil is. The details are in the devil. The engineers are in charge of maintaining the Trans-Alaska Pipeline, 800 miles long. They're having to do a lot more work these days, and I'll explain why. There's a term that the Alaskans are using now called the, referring to the trees up there frequently as the drunken trees. Well, that's kind of funny. The trees are tipping over because the permafrost is melting. The roots of these trees go down to the permafrost and they stop. Now with the permafrost melting, the trees are toppling over and the natives are calling them the drunken trees. 
which brings us to the Alaskan pipeline and the entire man-made infrastructure in Alaska. Every man-made structure in Alaska, whether it's the pipeline or buildings, telephone poles, roads, dams, were all built with the underlying engineering principle that the permafrost would always be, as the name implies, permanently frozen. Now that the permafrost is melting, the entire man-made infrastructure up there is at risk. People are having to buy jacks to put under their house because the foundations of their homes are collapsing. Roads are becoming like Six Flags rides. The pipeline has to have continuous surveillance and re-engineering and new concrete being poured and piers being put down to where it finally is solid because the entire Alaskan pipeline was built on top of the permafrost. Of course, that's what engineers knew, that's, that's what they were told, and they had no reason to believe otherwise that the permafrost would be anything other than permanently frozen. Rising ocean levels. So what's the big deal, John? Here's the big deal. 80% of the people on this planet live within 100 miles of an ocean. The closer you get to the water, the denser the population. Some areas you can go for miles and miles and miles from the water and still not be very many feet above sea level. Pastor mentioned in his introduction Parts of Florida are 55 feet above sea level. Most of Florida isn't. The part above sea level, 55 feet, is not very much of Florida. What's at risk when the ocean levels rise is the infrastructure that runs the ports, has the port facilities for ocean-going ships, the ships that move the bulk loads of corn and wheat, and soybeans, the ships that move the bulk petroleum products, and the coal, and the lumber, and the iron ore, all the things that modern society needs to function. The port facilities are at risk of being damaged or destroyed. The infrastructure that supports all these people, the potable water facilities, making fresh water, sewage treatment, telecommunications, the power grid, natural gas, the roads, all that infrastructure is at risk of being damaged or destroyed if and when the ocean levels rise. I mentioned the Ross Ice Shelf a few minutes ago. There used to be a couple of other ice shelves out there, Larsen A, that's L-A-R-S-E-N, A is an alpha, L-A-R-S-E-N B is in Bravo, I know a lot of people watching this tape have seen the Hollywood movie, The Day After Tomorrow. The opening scene in The Day After Tomorrow, they've got an American flag at this Antarctic Research Center. I had to watch the movie the second time before I saw this. There's a subtitle superimposed on the flag, and I didn't catch it because it was only flashed for about eight seconds. It said, Larson B. Ice Shelf, superimposed on the American flag. The opening scene is the Larsen B ice shelf breaking away from the Antarctic continent and drifting off into the ocean. That really did happen, ladies and gentlemen. That's real science. And up until a few days ago, when an even larger iceberg broke off, it was, up till that time, the largest ice shelf ever to break away. It, of course, was attached to the Ross ice shelf. The Ross ice shelf is about 265,000 square miles. That's about the size of Texas. It rises above the ocean 600 to 3,000 feet. The Antarctic continent, ladies and gentlemen, has approximately 70% of all the fresh water on planet Earth locked up in ice, thousands of feet thick all over the continent. And it is melting, and it's melting from underneath. Is it time for a break? <laughs> Five, four, three. Ladies and gentlemen, I already explained what the government's private response is, and that's to build shelters to take care of their own people. These shelters have been all built all over the country. However, there's more to that that you don't know. 
Apparently, the United States Navy has built undersea cities. My friend told me about this last August while we were having lunch. And then when I, while I was having dinner with this other veteran of the submarine corps, this intelligence officer, I brought up the topic, and I'm talking to my friend, the college professor sitting next to him, about these undersea bases, undersea cities where hundreds of men and women can live and work and be comfortable with all the amenities. Well, the former intelligence officer is just kind of eating his pasta and keeping quiet, and finally he looks up and he says, you know, there are some things you just can't talk about. Let's move on to a different topic, however, and that would be the Vatican's private response. Now, when I first heard about this, I didn't make the connection. But when I found out about the second piece of information, all the, everything else fell into place. There's something called the Vatican Observatory Research Group, and they operate something called the Vatican Advanced Technology Telescope. Now, that's a mouthful. Located at Mount Graham International Observatory in southeastern Arizona. Now, I spent most of my life thinking that the Catholic Church was involved in saving souls, uh, running hospitals, Mother Teresa helping the people over there in India, that kind of thing. It never occurred to me that the Vatican would be so interested in astronomy that they would go to the time and the expense of building and manning a professional observatory. It's, it's sort of like the Marine Corps selling used cars. I mean, you know, it just doesn't fit. It's not part of their mission statement. But we need to remember, ladies and gentlemen, that the Vatican is a foreign government. They have their own postage stamps. They have their own bank. They have a defined territory that's their country. And without a doubt, the Vatican has an intelligence service, and they have vaults full of documents going back for nearly 20 centuries, at least 17 centuries, full of documents from all over the planet that they've acquired. Back in 1999, an engineer friend of mine, radio frequency engineer, was retrained, retained by the Sisters of St. Agnes in St. Louis. Now, this is a Catholic order that runs a retirement home, and for several thousand dollars a month, you will be well cared for. It's a very nice place. My friend, the RF engineer, radio frequency engineer, this is the kind of guy that you could hire to come in and set up a, a 50,000 watt commercial radio station. He really knows his stuff. The contract with the Sisters of St. Agnes was to engineer, design, purchase, and install two-way radio communications at this facility in St. Louis to talk to the Vatican in Rome halfway around the planet. Now, we're not talking, ladies and gentlemen, about 10-4 good buddy CB equipment here. We're talking professional grade military communications equipment that is for serious people that want to do serious communications. Now, of course, you would have to have the exact same type of equipment in the Vatican, or they couldn't talk back and forth. At the same time, he found out that the Sisters of St. Agnes purchased real estate in the Missouri Ozarks, built a building out there, and stocked it with food, blankets, beds, medical supplies, water, everything people would need to, be, to live and be comfortable. Point being, ladies and gentlemen, the Vatican Church, like any large organization, will attempt to take care of their own people to the best of their ability. That's just the way big organizations work. It doesn't matter whether it's the U.S. government, IBM, or the Vatican. All large organizations want to care for their people to the best of their ability. And to my satisfaction, that is the Vatican's private response to Planet X. At the time, we thought, uh, keep in mind, this was 1999, we thought this was Y2K related. We didn't know any better. Nothing else made sense. But now, putting two and two together, we're getting four. You put the Vatican purchasing all this equipment for communications 
and spending the money to set up a professional observatory in Arizona. And of course, what do you have? You have preparations for Planet X, nothing else. In passing, I've mentioned a pole shift several times. A pole shift is when the North Pole moves from some place other than what it is. We don't know for sure how many pole shifts there's been, possibly as many as 150. A typical pole shift is about 20 degrees, which may not sound like a whole lot, seeing as how 180 degrees would be a complete flip-flop. What does 20 degrees mean? Well, if you're at the equator, 20 degrees doesn't mean a whole lot. You're not going to notice a big difference if you're at the equator. However, if you're in Maine and you get a 20 degree pole shift, you could get the climate of Atlanta, Georgia, or you could get the climate of what's almost the Arctic Circle with a 20 degree pole shift. So the farther north you get, the more drastic a small change can make. Going back to the film, The Day After Tomorrow, there was some science in there, as well as the Hollywood special effects and sensationalism and bad science. The three youngsters in that film are in a museum, and one of the displays is a stuffed mastodon. Now, most people know that mastodons have been found frozen in Siberia. That's fairly common knowledge. Here's some things you may not know, however. And this, uh, people in the audience who are farmers and hunters, they'll know what I'm about to say. When a mammal dies, it could be a cow or a deer, it doesn't matter. When a mammal dies, the first thing to deteriorate is the eyeball. Within hours, especially if it's warm, insects will attack that eyeball and it will start to deteriorate. And by the end of the day, it, the deterioration will be well underway. The mastodons found frozen in Siberia, the eyeballs were not deteriorated. In fact, the mastodons were flash frozen so quickly that the meat was still fresh enough that it was being harvested and sold for human consumption in Russian markets. It wasn't just two or three mastodons, it was hundreds of mastodons found frozen in a similar fashion. The mastodons were standing there one moment, calmly eating a subtropical plant, and the next, they're fla flash frozen permanently for thousands of years. Flash frozen so quickly that the meat never had time to deteriorate even after all those years. What caused that to happen? A pole shift could have done that. A pole shift can happen in a matter of hours. I'm going to get into a rather dramatic explanation of what a pole shift would make happen on this planet towards the end of this presentation. But now it's time for some scientific evidence. People love individuals with credentials. We like to see guys with white lab coats and all these letters behind their name. That gives credibility. In the area of astronomy, about the highest credentials you could ever hope to have would be to become the supervising astronomer for the United States Naval Observatory. I became, I became aware of an interview with that very man back in 1990, Dr. Robert Harrington, who at the time he was interviewed, and, and the interview was tape recorded, of course, videotaped, August 30th, 1990, at the time of the interview, in his office at the United States Naval Observatory, he was the supervising astronomer. Now, there's lots of astronomers. In fact, there's children that got telescopes and look at stars. And there's high school teachers that got telescopes and look at stars. Lots of amateur astronomers that have some ability and some knowledge. Just like a, your local paramedic knows how to stop bleeding, is one level of expertise. The man who teaches heart transplants at Harvard University is another level of expertise when it comes to stopping bleeding. Both men know how to stop bleeding, but drastically different credentials. When it comes to the astronomy, Dr. Harrington had the best credentials in that career 
that you could ever want to have. The interview was recorded on, and is on a DVD titled, titled, Are We Alone in the Universe? Now, the, most of the DVD involves statements by Zachariah Sitchin. Now, Sitchin's kind of an unusual guy in himself. You can take one look at Zachariah Sitchin, and you say, there's a guy that spent 40 years in a library. <laughs> he can pick up Sumerian clay tablets and read them like the newspaper. I mean, what a guy. But these last 15 minutes, when he's interviewing Dr. Harrington, are very, very revealing. I'm going to have some quotes here from Dr. Harrington. We've been looking for this thing, the 10th planet, for 12 years, since 1978. We predicted the existence of the 10th planet in 1978. Now, ladies and gentlemen, when the supervising astronomer for the United States Naval Observatory tells you there's a 10th planet, I think you better well be paying attention. Quote Dr. Harrington, if it turns out to be on a 3,600-year orbit, he didn't know the length or, or the exact structure of the orbit at that time. Professor Harrington, again, he believes it has a mass, quote, unquote, a mass of three to five times the mass of Earth. Dr. Harrington, again, perfectly capable of supporting life forms of one kind or another. Dr. Harrington goes on to show a diagram of what he believes to be the elliptical orbit of planet X. Not long after this interview in 1990, Dr. Harrington announced that he was going to pack up his telescope and go to the Antarctic and look for planet X. Not long after that, it was announced that he had a fast-acting form of cancer and he was dead in about 90 days. March 1992 press release from NASA. Unexplained deviations in the orbits of Uranus and Neptune point to a large outer solar system body, four to eight Earth masses on a highly tilted orbit beyond seven billion miles from the sun. They went looking for this thing and they found it. They used their mathematical calculations to determine where this object should be out there and they sent the Pioneer space probe looking for it and they found it. Now, NASA's been playing games with us, ladies and gentlemen, for a lot of years here. Sometimes NASA is referred to as never a straight answer. And I think with good reason. I mentioned Dr. Velikowski a couple of times. Dr. Velikowski was a medical doctor. He's been deceased for quite a while, probably more than 20 years. He started writing his books about 1950. One book is titled Earth and Upheaval. I have here in front of me a photocopy of one page of one book, page 132. Now what this one page does is summarize hundreds and hundreds of reports and facts and figures of what happens during a pole shift based on real research by real scientists based on digging up evidence that demonstrates what happens during a pole shift. This one page is a bit dramatic, but it paints a very good word picture as to what would happen. And I'll begin quoting Dr. Velikowski. Let us assume as a working hypothesis that under the impact of a force or the influence of an agent, and the Earth does not travel in an empty universe, the axis of the Earth shifted or tilted. At that, earth, at that moment, an earthquake would make the globe shudder. Air and water would continue to move through inertia. Hurricanes would sweep the Earth, and the seas would rush over continents, carrying gravel and sand and marine animals and casting them on the land. Heat would be developed. Rocks would melt. Volcanoes would erupt. Lava would flow from fissures in the erupted ground and cover vast areas. Mountains would spring up from the plains and would travel and climb on the shoulders of other mountains, causing rifts and faults. Lakes would be tilted and emptied. Rivers would change their beds. Large land areas with all their inhabitants would slip under the sea. 
Forests would burn, and hurricanes and wild seas would rust them from the ground on which they grew and pile them branch and root in huge heaps. Seas would turn in the deserts, their waters rolling away. And if a change in the velocity of the rotation, slowing it down, should accompany the shifting of the axis, the water confined to the equatorial oceans by centrifugal force would retreat to the poles, and high tides and hurricanes would rush from pole to pole, carrying reindeer and seals to the tropics and desert lions into the Arctic, moving from the equator to the mountain ridges of the Himalayas and down the African jungles, and crumpled rocks torn from splintering mountains would be scattered over large distances and herds of animals would be washed from the plains of Siberia. The shifting of the axis would also change the climate of every place, leaving corals in Newfoundland, elephants in Alaska, fig trees in northern Greenland, and luxuriant forests in Antarctica. In the event of a rapid shift of the axis, rapid sp many species and genre of animals on land and in the sea would be destroyed, and civilizations would be reduced to ruins. Now 50 years ago when this was written there was a lot of speculation in here as far as the average person was concerned. He talks about civilization slipping into the sea. You know ladies and gentlemen since World War II we have the new sport of scuba diving which didn't exist prior to World War II. We have imaging techniques to look through the oceans and see what's down there. Just fairly recently, a city was found stretching between the island of Okinawa and the main islands of Japan, a city of very large stone buildings. I've seen photographs of some of these buildings with scuba divers next to them. The scuba divers look like little toy soldiers compared to these large stone buildings. Stone buildings have been found under the sea in the Caribbean. The ancient city of Alexandria, Egypt, has been found just off the coast of Egypt in the Mediterranean. And the list goes on and on and on of man-made structures being found under the ocean all over the planet. The bones of animals have been found in caves. Not where they died and fell to their final resting place, but apparently crushed and jumbled together under a huge force, most likely water, crushed and jumbled together. You dig down through the permafrost in Alaska that I mentioned earlier, and you do, in fact, find tropical plants and coal. Christopher Columbus, it's been known, had maps when he went on his journey to the find the new world, had maps showing the Antarctic continent without ice. Now it wasn't until after World War II that we had the imaging technology to see through the ice and tell where the land stopped and the ocean began. Once we had that imaging technology, scientists could prove the accuracy of the maps that Christopher Columbus had in his possession. Maps which were made from much older maps in fact, even more recently than Columbus, similar maps were found on dusty shelves in Constantinople. <clears throat> to understand this issue, ladies and gentlemen, you're going to have to do your own homework. The best living scientist that I know on this topic is Professor James McCanny, MS. The two books I most recommend are Planet X, Comets and Earth Changes and Surviving Planet X Passage. I highly recommend, in addition, Atlantis to Tesla and Principia Meteorologica, Meteorologica that's a mouthful, The Physics of Sun-Earth Weather. I recommend some other books, but those are the main ones. What the people, the weather people, have been telling you on radio and TV about the weather is only half the truth. What they'll tell you is that all weather on planet Earth is caused by the sun. Now, that's true. What they'll tell you is the sun has become a lot more active 
And that is true. What they won't tell you, however, is the reason the sun is becoming more active. There is a vast new source of energy interacting with our sun and causing it to become more active. It's been known for a number of decades that our sun goes through an 11-year cycle of increasing solar activity to a high point for 11 years and then decreasing solar activity for 11 years to a low point. The high point was supposed to be about three years ago. Three years ago in this case being 2001. We are three years past it at this point in time and solar activity continues to get higher and higher levels of M-class flares and X-class flares, sunspots, all the things with which create the weather that we have on planet Earth. So you would be well advised, all of you out there watching this tape, to do your own homework and come to understand what these issues really are and why our weather is doing what it is doing. One of the things that happened to me when I started researching this will happen to most of you watching this tape if you don't get this warning first, and that's to not go down the rabbit trail of looking for a date. I'm pretty convinced at this point that a date doesn't matter. A particular month doesn't matter. It becomes clear pretty quickly that the two most dangerous points are the closest passage going past Earth into the solar system, past us, behind the sun, and then once again when it comes back out on the other side of the sun. These events have been going on when I say these events, these Earth changes events involving bizarre weather events, earthquakes, volcanoes have been going on now for well more than two years and I fully expect them to go on for several more years. How many more years I can't say, however, there will be times when it gets a lot more violent and there will be times of a bit more peace, I believe. Some people believe, that, that haven't looked at this very carefully, that Planet X may hit the Earth. No, that won't happen. It hasn't happened yet. It's been swinging through here every 3,600 years for quite some time. The odds of us hitting us are remote, and if it did, we all go, meet, go to meet Jesus, and that's the end of that, and nothing to worry about. A member of the audience wants to know how long will it be before millions begin to die. What happened on December 26? is, in my mind, the beginning point of that. I've seen numbers ranging from a quarter million to half a million dead right now. Some of these areas are so remote that when a rescue helicopter went to land on one of these islands, it was attacked by natives with bows and arrows. Uh, they aren't used to seeing anybody from the outside world. The countries where these people live did not know how many people lived there before the tsunami, so how could they possibly know how many people were there after the tsunami or could have been killed? A member of the audience wants to know, will we ever be able to see Planet X? The answer is yes, to the best of my knowledge, we will. It comes up from the south now, if you say this is the sun, all our planets go around more or less on a flat plane. This planet comes up from the south, from our south pole, goes behind our sun, comes back down like that. For quite a period of time you'll be able to see Planet X, probably from your own backyard without any uh, instruments of any kind. Something as large as three to five times the mass of Earth is something you can't hide. So ladies and gentlemen, just to recap this portion of it real quick, don't go looking for a date and don't get too worried about the orbit and how close it's going to come to Earth.